Um, so um, my question is kind of related to a um, uh, section of chapter 24 of the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, where Krishna is kind of explaining to Nanda Maharaj uh, why the residents of Braj should worship Govardhan Hill instead of Indra before the lifting of the Govardhan Hill. And um, I guess I was just a little confused about, um, you know, sort of like some of the arguments that he gives, or I was wondering if you could speak a bit about that speech that he gives to Nanda Maharaj, because he, he sort of mentions things like, uh, quoting here, it is karma alone that is the enemy, friend, or partial, impartial observer, the guru and the Lord, and therefore grounded in one's own nature and performing one's duty, one should worship karma and sort of seems like he's not talking as much about bhakti in that, um, in that uh, conversation. And I guess I was kind of wondering if you could clarify um, the reasonings behind uh, why Krishna speaks the way he does in that, in that uh, part of the Bhagavatam. Yes, Krishna speaking opposite onto, oh goodness, what to do. Um, Yes, there in that section, Krishna gives arguments for not worshiping Govardhan Hill, which is not, which as he reveals later on, is not, excuse me, not worshiping Indra, but rather worshiping the hill, which later on he shows is not different from himself. All of the Dom is the ex extension of his own self, but uh, he showed that in particular in relation to Govardhan. So it takes on a special position, Govardhan, within all of the uh, um, features, if you will, of nature, the mountains, the trees, river of Jamuna, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> um, excuse me. So through Govardhan, he, you could also say he revealed that he's non different than, it, than, than, the, than the Dom. <clears throat> But um, in speaking to Nanda Baba with a view to dissuade him from the worship of Indra, which was a custom, um, which Krishna asked, is, is this like, where's this idea come from? Hmm. Is it just made up? Is it just uh, a... Um, a uh, something that's been superstition that's been passed down, you know, for for uh, generations. <clears throat> After all, Nikita Krishna says the demigods are unbelievable. <laughs> Those who believe in them are, are not not wise. He says they're not intelligent. <laughs> um, of course, he means believe in them by investing hmm, your faith and uh, pursuing your prospect in life in relation to what they have the power to um, afford one. But at any rate, um, it's such, just such a nice leader that it, it, just thinking about it causes one to go off in a number of different directions. Um, so thank you for your question. But to get to the point, um, he seeks, Krishna seeks to dissuade Nanda Baba from worshiping Indra, and he, in doing so, he invokes arguments from the karma mimamsa philosophy, karma is everything, and the Sankhya philosophy also, about the nature of nature, as it's thought there. Um, both of these doctrines um, are well, they're two of the six prominent darshans or philosophies of ancient India. And you'll find they, that they come up in the Bhagavatam here and there, wherein aspects of them are acknowledged, accepted, and embraced by Vedanta and other features of them um, are not. So this is a situation the Govardhan Leela, just prior, well, it's in the midst of the beginning of the Govardhan Leela, where um, Krishna's not speaking about unalloyed bhakti to himself, 
directly, which would also be problematic, given that uh, they are in everyone sees him as their son, their friend, their lover, and so forth, rather than as the Godhead. So rather than come out and speak, everyone should do Sharanagati to me alone, Sarvadharman Pritya Mekam Sharanam, but that may be appropriate for Bhagavad Gita to say that as Krishna does in his concluding words to Arjuna that are meant to be heard and imbibed by the world over through the medium of um, his uh, speaking to, to warrior Arjuna, Pandava Arjuna. That's Bhagavad Gita, right? Here he is establishing what is the real real dharma. Well, that's not something that he necessarily does directly in Braj. It's done more indirectly, given the, the uh, circumstances, as I mentioned, the sentiments, as I, as I mentioned, the feelings about Krishna, who he is, and so on and so forth. So Krishna uses here um, arguments from doctrines that very well may uh, be to one extent or another embraced by the um, uh, gopas. Mm -hmm. um, there are ashramis, mm -hmm. right? On, on, a, on, on the surface, that is. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they follow all the varnashram uh, principles and so on and so forth. They're religious. Um, people, but that's just a structure, you know, that that serves to facilitate the the expression of their of their transcendental uh, bhava. Mm -hmm. So, to anyways, to take an, an, an argument from karma mimamsa philosophy mm -hmm. or from uh, varnashram and employ it. Uh, makes sense to given their their um, outer, if you will, uh, perspective the in, in, in terms of the nature of, of the leela. Mm. So um, he does so, mm. and um, also you can say that um, what he's doing there is saying that. Even the karma by karma mimamsa, if you want to go there, even if you want to go by Sankhya philosophy, hmm, I should be worshipped. Hmm. And uh, but look at it, look at it from this angle, these philosophies from this angle of vision. This says this, the conclusion of which is Hindu shouldn't be worshipped, the hill should be worshipped, and he showed I am the hill. So something like that. Does that help? Uh, yes, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, thank you very much, Guru Maharaj. Okay. Um, Pedro has a question. Oh, okay. Um, I think, did he send it? And he sent it to me in a direct message, so um, I will read it. Um, he says, hello, Maharaj. So I was reading um, Canto 10 in the Brahma v. Mohan Lila when Brahma saw the cowherd boys turn into Vishnu, into Vishnus. I got confused because one of the liberations is having the same body as the Lord. So how could Brahma know um, that they were in fact Vishnu and not just having the same body as Vishnu, the same body of Vishnu? As liberated souls, Brahma couldn't see the divinity of Krishna. That is why he tried to test him. So, how could he see that all the cowherd boys turned into Vishnus? How could he see they all turned into Vishnus? Because he might have thought instead that they were all devotees of Vishnu who had forms like Vishnu. Is that the, what the, what the question is? Um, I'm still trying to figure it out. Uh, Pedro said yes. Yes. Okay. That's that's a form of mukti called sayud uh, sarupya mukti, having a form like God's form. Um, so, very simply, uh, to answer your question, the word "like" should loom very large there. They have a form like Narayan. There are those who have sarupya mukti. 
but it's not um, the same as Narayan's. So there are certain characteristics of Narayan's form that are unique to him and do not appear in those who have Sayuja Mukti, who have li the liberation in which, which consists of, among other things, having a form like Narayan. So they don't have the Srivats marking on this, uh, over his chest and so forth. Um, that's one, I think there, there's another one as well, but that, that, that's the principal one. So they're distinguished in that way. Um, when Gopu Kumar arrived in Baikuntha and he saw someone with Sayuja Mukti, he thought, oh, there is not a Gopal, there is, there is Narayan, there, there is, a, there is a, my, my God. At that time, he was uh, worshiping in Aishvarya, in the land of Aishvarya. And everyone said, no, 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 no that's not him. You know? Uh, 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 he's, and he said, I'm not, I'm not Narayan, no, 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 I'm just a servant and so forth. So there was some confusion on his part, but then when he saw Narayan, he could see the, the difference as well in terms of the markings and, and so on. So he is distinguished in that way. That's a simple answer to your question, but I think that, um, that uh, he, 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 even if, let's say the coward boys only showed forms of, of, of devotees in Sa, Sa, Sarupya Mukti, it would have been pretty overwhelming <laughs> for, uh, for Brahma. And he would have, have to think that these coward boys are actually muktas, uh, like, uh, associates of Narayan, like I've been inspiring to be, but they're here in another form uh, with Krishna. And so Krishna must be, he can manifest them. He, anyway, he would have probably come to a fairly similar conclusion, but um, again, the, the definitive or the final answer is they have, Sayuja Mukti has a, has a form like Narayan, but there are differences and they're significant enough, as I say, that when Gopu Kumar saw an Orion, he could, oh, he, then he could see the difference between the Soja Mukta uh, that he had previously or at first in, encountered and thought was um, Orion. So anyway, that's a, yeah, that's an interesting type of, 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 of Mukti. I mean, all of these four types of Mukti, Sauja, Sarupya, Salokya, Sarsti, and, and the fifth type, Sauja, are not desirable um, for the Gaudiya. Vaishnavas who worship Govinda Krishna. And um, of course, the Leela, Brahma Bhiva Mohan Leela, makes the case very clearly that uh, Krishna is the source of Narayan. And therefore, the point is, he must have his, um, his own abode where these relationships, like the relationships between, the relationship between his friends and himself, Sakyaras, has a place because there's no place for that in Vaikuntha. If Krishna was only an incarnation of Narayan, there would be no abode where there could be this Madhurya Rasa, Sakya Rasa, um, and the possibility of entering into Vatsali Rasa with God. That doesn't happen um, in Vaikuntha. Narayan doesn't have a father and a mother. Hmm? He doesn't have uh, you know, friends. Uh, they're all servants there, lovers, uh, even Lakshmi um, is massaging his feet. Uh, and so forth. Therefore, she wanted to try the try, try the rasa dance with Krishna. That looked a little more like what she thought before she got married. Married life would be like a little more romantic. Hmm. Um, so um, uh, that's why you find in Brihad Bhagavatamrita you have a chapter about the highest form of worship, which comes ultimately to Gopi Bhava. And then you have the, the canto. And then the second canto is about the place that corresponds with it. Because if there is such a Bhava, then the conclusion at the end of or the thought at the end of the first canto of the Brihad Bhagavatam would be, well, where does that take place? I mean, Vaikuntha is the spiritual world and that's not, is this only happening on earth? Is this something that Narayan manifests on earth for a short time as a Leela avatar? And the, associates who love him in this way and other intimate ways are just manifestations of himself that that it's not something that anybody else can directly participate in he can show it from now now, now and then on john mastami and Baikuntha, and everybody can be delighted 
by the leela, but I mean, you can't associate yourself like that with, with God. Hmm? So this is an important feature or aspect or um, um, implication of Krishna's two Bhagavan Swami. It's one of the reasons where we, we kind of emphasize it over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. A foundational point of Siddhanta. Because if Krishna is not the source of Narayan, then he has, then, we're, then there's no Goloka. Mm -hmm. No place for that. He's just in Vaikuntha. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, uh, it, but I'm going to side there, but it's a, that is a, a prominent feature of the Brahma Vimohan Leela. Mm -hmm. That uh, point is brought out through there through the Leela narrative in no uncertain terms. Does that help? Pedro, I hope it does. If it doesn't, you can ask further and I will try to address any further questions or current concerns or thoughts that come to mind. Uh, yeah, he said it yeah, he said it helps in the chat. Um, so Indra? Hare Krishna, pronounce. Hi, well, Can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Oh, really? I can hear you. Yeah, um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Okay, Hare Krishna, sorry for that. Um, so I do have like a two-in-one question. So sometimes devotees say, uh, instead of happy birthday, they say like happy appearance day. Or they also say, oh yeah, back then in my Grihasta Lila, you know. Um, so I just wanted to um, understand what your mood is regarding, um, you know, people taking this transcendental vocabulary and kind of like applying this to their kind of like mundane lives. Is it is it a good thing or should we be really careful? Because I also heard that, you know, you should not actually say appearance uh, for, yeah, just like normal devotees. But I also didn't find the scriptural evidence for that. It's just something that I heard. So, and then I, the second question kind of like tied into this is um, how much are we allowed to be the thought police like in this regard, you know? So, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, um I think that uh, first of all, the the term avirbha appearance. I, I would think that the Sanskrit for that is that we use avirbha. Um, it speaks of um, a the um, manifestation of the Godhead or his expansion or his associate uh, under the influence of his internal energy. Mm -hmm. um, rather than the birth of someone in this world that's under the influence of the external energy. Mm -hmm. And uh, birth is not uh, thought to be in a larger sense, in, in, well, in one sense, auspicious because that which is born dies, that which is dies born, is born again, and so on and so forth. And birth and death is, is something that um, we, we, we seek to uh, bring an end to, right? And live in eternity. So, <clears throat> um, so given that fact, that these facts, we don't refer to Krishna's appearance, if you will, as his birth per se. We might, from a Madhurya point of view, in the context of the Leela uh, and so forth, but stepping back from a bigger picture, in one sense, of his Aishvarya and his godhood, which we want to understand and establish hopefully in the, in, 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 in the world, um, his divinity, then we, uh, we, uh, we, we speak of it as Abhirbhav appearance, in his disappearance, we use these terms. Um, I remember when Prabhupada passed away, if you will, one of my godbrothers called the newspaper in the town and said, we wanted to inform you that A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami just, uh, just disappeared and left the world left the world and the guy and they didn't know what he was talking about he, he disappeared where did he go he left the world where did he go so uh <laughs> so um these are probably um not the best ways to talk about um well anyway in ordinary parlance amongst one another and speaking about one we were you were asking about birthdays 
I think you'd use the term birth, happy birthday if you want to wish somebody a happy birthday. You wish them a happy birthday rather than a happy appearance because their appearance in the world, their birth in the world is different than Krishna's birth. So we would, you know, distinguish it in that way. I've never heard anybody say that, happy appearance day, but I guess they do, some of them. Now, there's another way in which, of course, we can look at the birth and human life in which one also gets a sadhguru as being a very auspicious life. So it can be a happy life hmm? that you have. Birth doesn't have to be a bad thing. Um, birth in general is, an, is, is a necessity in order for her to work out and through and pass beyond one's karma. Vishnu manifests the world, gives bodies and so forth so that people can, there's a purpose to that, so they can come out of their, their um, karma that is, that is, that is um, suppressed but still you know, present within, in Susupti. So, so the, you know, there's another way to look at the birth as being auspicious, if you will. And again, especially human birth, and to an exponentially more so human birth in which we have sadhu sangha and a sadhu guru. I mean, you know, that's, that's very, very auspicious. That's what's worth being happy about, happy birthday. So that's a good way to explain it to people. Oh, my birth is a bad day today. Today I was born, you know, it's, I had to take birth on this day and it's in this terrible human body and so forth. Well, you know, is it a positive spin that you could put on it, which which is, would be appropriate considering the positive nature of bhakti, right? Um, if you look at half the picture, it's pessimistic. If you look at the whole pic picture, it's extremely optimistic. Hmm? The picture of Gaudiya Vedanta. So, um, so I, I wouldn't use the term you know, "happy appearance day." I would just say "happy birthday," to someone. Um, but the, the larger question that you ask is how much should be the thought police? And that's an interesting uh, question. And um, I think that um, there's probably a time in most of Odi's life where they really think that that's uh, appropriate on one level or another. Mm -hmm. um, they think it's appropriate in terms of how to do it like this, you shouldn't do it like that, and so forth, as, as they've learned. Uh, and the, this with the good, good intentions, because they want to do it right, and, and they feel that it, the right way is very precise, because they learned it in, in that way, and they're new to it, and so forth, and so on. Um, as they go further, they may see that, oh, there, there are some relativity with which how to do that particular thing. Hmm. In, in let's say in, in Archon or something uh, or some in, 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 in the, uh, another Gaudiya sect next door they do it a little differently well it, you know these are just details it's okay then they but in, in the context of that sometimes the Bodhis they will be well the Siddhanta however that's very exact it's very precise extremely precise and and, and they would be very preoccupied um, with that and, and somewhat militant, if you will, about seeing that devotees understand um, the Siddhanta. And that's good, but that can be abused too. That can be, end up um, being something that's, uh, that's counterproductive and questionable for that matter, because it's very difficult to come up with what is orthodox Gaudiya Vaishnavism. <laughs> I was thinking about this just the other day, um, just yesterday. You know, you have uh, Christianity, and there are all types of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and some of them very much at odds with with uh, with one with one another as to what Christianity is. Although they all worship Jesus, they all think he died on the cross, you know, and was resurrected, and so forth. There's some divisions within Islam. There are many divisions within Buddhism. Hinduism is just like full of divisions uh, more than any anyway it's very inclusive and then when you come to the schools of Vedanta well you know you got a couple of different schools in Ramanuja you probably only got one in in Madhva and you come to Gaudi and I realize well there's all these like varieties of it it's just like it, that's not just what you see in the international community but in India for hundreds of years there are very different um, ideas about um, what constitutes orthodox Gaudiya Vaishnavism among those who will follow very strictly uh, um, 
uh, in terms of um, pursuing self-control, control of senses, mind, and so on and so forth, uh, basic you know, features of yoga. Um, I would say like the serious, I wanna say serious ego facing spiritual practitioners within Gaudiya Vaishnavism. There are many different opinions, even different opinions between Jiva Goswami and Rupa Goswami, between uh, the Goswamis of Vrindavan and, um, and uh, um, Kavi Karnapur with regard to Rasa and so forth. There are so many nuances and differences that at a point you just gotta go, well, they're all worshiping Chaitanya Mahaprabhu um, there may be some that are, are, you know, extreme in their differences that, for example, uh, advocate sense indulgence, you know, in the name of Parakhi or something like that. Now, that's another thing hmm, that we understandably would, um, would, 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 would reject. But what is... You know, there's, there's, uh, look at, you know, you can say, for example, well, we were talking about the, you know, five types of mukti that are mentioned in the Bhagavatam, the fifth of which is Sayuja, which Krishna's Kaviraj depicts in a particular way, and the Vrindavan Goswamis also in a particular way, hmm? as undesirable, um, as a form of uh, impersonal liberation, even Vishwanath Shakti Thakur. Um, says it's uh, it's uh, undesirable from a devotional point of view. Then you come with the with the commentator of the on the uh, Gaudiya commentator on the sutras of Vyas, Baladi um, Bidibusan, who arguably by his commentary on Vedanta Sutra gave new life uh, to Gaudiya Vaishnavas because of Baladi Bidibusan when speaking about the classical forms of Vedanta, hmm, Gaudi Vaishnavism comes up. It wouldn't come up. Hmm. It wouldn't be classified, that means to say, along with Ramanuja, Madhva, Shankar, hmm, uh, Nimbarka, and, and, so, and so on and so forth, um, without Baladev's commentary. So it, it, it's, it's, it's really considerable what he was empowered you know, to do. And in the commentary, he, he gives a whole different interpretation of Sayuja, a very positive one. He says that it's the basis of all forms of love of God. It means a, a, a sense of identity, a oneness with, with, with God that's uh, necessary for Salokya, for Sayusa, Sarupya, for Samipya, and so on, et cetera. And arguably, as well for the love of, um, of God we find in in Brudge. So, you know, is that a, is that a deviation there? You know, um, um, of course not. Um, so, uh, yeah, as you go forward and as you get a little older, I think, and then I'll, I'll give you another interesting example. This, Pramod Puri Goswami Maharaj, the uh, godbrother of my, of my Guru Maharaj and close uh, associate uh, of Pujapat Sridhar Maharaj, my Siksha Guru, and whom I served also a new Pramod Puri Maharaj. Um, when he heard, this was around 1995, that um, there was a controversy in ISKCON as to whether or not uh, devotees fell from Vaikuntha, from the spiritual world, or their origins, if you will, uh, were, were, were not in the Braj Lila, uh, which is, uh, you know, the Vrindavan Goswami's, um, you know, teaching, obviously. Uh, but it was a controversy, and it was causing a lot of um, disturbance and and ISKCON was a very uh, you know big and successful in many respects um, mission for disseminating the teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu something that Bhakti Vinod very much wanted Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur uh, pursued and so on and so forth um, 
and my Guru Maharaj was, was able to, you know, was able to establish that ISKCON. And there's a lot of, lot of uh, value in the, in, in, in the group, you know, being together, the camaraderie that comes from it, the facility and so forth. And so when he heard about this, he said, oh, he said, but that's nothing to break up a movement over. Whether you fall from Goloka or not, he, he, he was very, so it's a very interesting how he felt about, well, this organization, they may say like this, but, you know, you know, how much is it going to be a factor in their progress that there are, and, and there, there are ways which you could you could say it's, it's going to be more of a problem than not, and you, you might want to establish the truth, but but then um, you know he made the comment, made that comment, so um, that's significant to, to that such a senior person, you know, felt like that hmm, about it. Hmm. Um, so those things have to be taken to um, heart as well, and it can perhaps soften the militants. Um, young bucks, you know, who, and I have been like that. We want to establish the philosophy, <laughs> make sure everybody knows it, and you know, hammer it home. And, and, and you know, there's that, that's that can be good for them. That can help them also. But it, 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 it there's another side to it, as I'm as I'm saying, and um, so it has its uh, its limitations. I wouldn't, uh, you know, the saffron police or the mental, my, the, uh, what did you call them? The mind police, my thought police, thought police and so forth. Um, yeah, <laughs> it has its place, but its place is probably not as large uh, and important and significant as, as it may be thought by, by some. Um, does that help? Yes, thank you. Okay. So, I mean, if my friend wishes me like a happy appearance day, I would just take them lovingly aside and just let's have a conversation about this. <laughs> Maybe. You could, you could, you could, you could. Um, you, could you could just say, well, yeah. Anyway, you could have a conversation, but it'd be interesting, right? Okay, what else? Another question? Um, yeah, Omkar has a question. Okay. Pranam Guru Maharaj, can you hear me? Can't hear you. Oh, one sec, sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? You could be seen, but not heard. I'm yeah, I'm I'm hearing him. <laughs> um uh do you want just take the next question? I'm gonna type it in. Okay, okay. Um yeah, so Sharada sent a question, so and we'll just go back to Omkar, he's gonna type it. Um Sharada says, uh Pranam Maharaj, I have a question concerning a part of one of your commentaries on a Baba Nubad. Um I think on um, I think on the Brahma v. Mohan Leela, it mentions um, the sentence that mysticism is controlled, that mysticism, that mysticism is controlled objective subjectivity. Can you confirm the meaning of this? Can you hear me? She said I wrote that. Um, okay, she was saying that you wrote... Um, mysticism is controlled subjectivity and then she's asking can you confirm the meaning of this does it mean that love and its object are one and different and that krishna's form is self-manifest arising out of the type of devotee love devotees love thank you done about sharda and then that's in the chat so you can like look at what she wrote um if that might help yeah that might help let me take a look yeah um Concerning part of your commentaries, I think the Rami Mohan Lila mentions a sentence that mysticism is controlled, objective, subjectivity. Can you confirm the meaning of this? Does it mean that love and its object are one and different? That Krishna's form is self-manifesting, arising out of the type of devotees' love. That's certainly true. 
um, that uh, there is um, that uh, that uh, there's a subjectivity, if you will, to the objective position of Krishna. He arises in many respects out of the love of his devotees. Um, but I have to look at the commentary itself where I, where I said that mysticism is controlled, uh, objective subjectivity. It, it means that there's some, yeah, that's what it means. You've understood it. But I'll, I'll, I'll look at that further myself if I come up with anything else after revisiting something I wrote some, some time back. Um, I'll pass it on to you. But the understanding you have there is... is sufficient at the moment. She just, do you see what she I was saying? That, yeah, okay. I don't know if Mara said that or if I actually wrote that, maybe I, maybe I wrote it. Okay. okay um, right. So Omkar, I guess is still typing his question. That's the only question I have. Um, I think I, I got my sound working. Can you hear my Guru Maharaj? Yes. Good. Yeah, Pranam. Good, Good morning. I was wondering, um, I heard a statement recently that we may not take another birth as devotees being in touch with Mahaprabhu's Leela. And that kind of scares me. So is that actually true? Or is there a chance that we might just not be in touch with, you know, Mahaprabhu's dispensation? I don't know any reason. I couldn't imagine any reason why you would not be if you, because to be very sensible here, what determines your next birth? What determines what your next birth will be? What is the teaching? Anybody can say anything, but you should check it against the teaching. Teaching in the Gita is yam yam vyapi smaram bhavam chajateyante kalevaram tam tam evaiti kundeya sadatan bhava bhavita. Eighth chapter. Said there and it's said throughout the Gaudiya uh, supplementary texts as well. What that, but that, what you practice, which is means what you're, what's on your mind, hmm? what you practice determines uh, what you will attain. Hmm? What's on your mind in this life will determine what's, uh, what type of life you get, type of birth you get in the next life. So there's no, there's no real. The, the, the change is now, you know, where you are is where you are now, <laughs> right? If today you're, you're a Gaudiya Vaishnava and you're preoccupied with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teaching, Leela, and so on and so forth, even though you're distracted here and there, but as a sadhaka, that is your main focus. You're wearing the Kunti Mala and Tilaka and so on and so forth, and participating in these Sanghas. And then you, then your your body dies. Well, what happens? Your thoughts go with you. Your subtle body, in your subtle body, you 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 that is the vehicle to your next body. So you you changed cars, but uh, but you're the same uh, person in terms of your spiritual evolution. And that doesn't change. Krishna says in the Gita, what you've gained by this bhakti yoga, that's eternal because it's it's coming from the nirguna. Hmm. So, um, so that's kind of a, not a very well scripturally thought out uh, opinion. Hmm. So don't worry about that. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Now. Think about now that will be that will determine what, what you think about later <laughs> what you do now will determine what you do later what you're preoccupied with now so practice makes makes perfect so now you're practicing go to Vaishnava you'll keep practicing until you become perfect Jai another question um so there's no more questions uh Yes. Yeah, last week you were talking, Guru Dave, about the Siddhadeya and Sadhadeya, I believe it is. Uh, the Siddhadeya being. Uh, I'd like to uh, 
just go back for a minute to start this question. And I, I know I use the term objective subjectivity. Um, and if you throw in the word controlled, I think that uh, uh, one of the ways in which I have used that, I, I'm not sure how I use it in the Brahma Vimohan um, Bhavanavad or Brahma Stuti um, Bhavanavad, but uh, uh, spiritual life is thought by many people to be subjective and, and they're right in that sense. It's an inner experience um, as all of our experiences are. They're inner, they're private, um, they cannot be entirely shared by, by anyone, right? They can to some extent, someone can have a similar experience at the same time, in the same event, and they can resonate, and, and so, but there's always gonna be some difference, right? So we all have our own individual um, perspective. That's in, inescapable. This is a very significant uh, point of emphasis in Madhva's uh, philosophy of Dvaitabad, um, Vaishnavism, that um, despite the fact that jiva souls are differentiated by karma, which is external, hmm, karma is in terms of the reactions that we are experiencing that differentiate us from one another have has its origins in an internal uh, um, individual expression. So the external differences, if we look carefully at them, we have to say they're internal and karma has no beginning. Uh, so we say that all souls are, are like, are similar, but it's a, it's a, if you, if you can leave it at that or you can reason further and say, well, they may be similar, but they're, they're, they're not the same either. They're, 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 they're making different choices. Um, so, um, so at any rate, um, the fact that it, it just comes to my mind because this is a point of his where everyone has the unique individual experience, which, which everyone accepts, right? Subjective experience. Now, when we think of spiritual life as subjective, okay, that's, that's, that's true, but some people dismiss the spiritual experiences of others is subjective because they cannot be objectively demonstrated to be what the experience leads one to believe it is. Hmm? I may have my spiritual experience, it leads me to believe um, something about myself, but it can't be objectively verified. Hmm? Um, so when I sometimes speak about objective subjectivity, and if you throw the word controlled in, I'm also speaking about the, I'm speaking about the idea that we as sadhakas are, in a sense, scientists. Prabhupada used to like to say, it's not just a belief, it's a, it's a science, which he meant, by which he meant there was some methodology to this. And then if you uh, engage in bhakti um, in this way, that you're going to get this um, results and it's consistent hmm, um, over time, and that we produced, you know, many um, in the history of the sampradaya uh, uh, results um, um, that are, you know, uh, consistent. So it's it's in that way it's it's a, it's a science, if you will, and it's also a science in a sense that well, science is supposed to, like law, just follow the facts rather than the emotions of a person, which could lead one to think, believe, feel uh, this way or that way. Um, so we would dismiss that. We'll just talk about the, what the objective facts are. So there's some objectivity, what I'm saying, for a real sadhaka to their subjective experiences of spiritual life. This is something that Thomas Merton, as a, as a Christian a Catholic uh, monk, um, wa was turned uh, to the East mm, by the fact that the East, as he learned from actually, uh, it's a famous uh, devotee, one of the greatest Grodia theologians of the 20th century, Mahanam Brat Brahmacharya, who wrote his thesis on Jiva Goswami's um, 
understanding of Gaudiya Vaishnavism um, in contrast with Shankar and, and, and Ramanuja. It's a very, very powerful, powerful uh, thesis. Uh, very, very insightful, very robust and, and uh, organic. Um, um, I can't really say enough about it, but um, it, it was written probably in, uh, uh, well, anyway, sometime in the, in the, in the, in the 20th century, but he um, was a mentor of Thomas Merton. There was a, uh, when he passed away, Nam Brahmacharya in, I think, 1980 or something like that, 85, 86, New York Times published an article about him um, and his friendship and mentorship, uh, how he served as a teacher to um, Thomas Merton, helped turn him eastward. Thomas Merton, of course, wrote a commentary, wrote an wrote a, um, endorsement of Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita. But it's interesting. He, he's, a, he's a very um, much appreciated Catholic um, monk, theologian, if you will, with Eastern leanings. And his Eastern leaning was, was, was he was turned in that direction by the example and the, and the uh, philosophy uh, of Nam Mahanam Brat Brahmachari, who was, uh, was a Gaudiya Vaishnava. So anyway, he went East, the point is, for a methodology hmm, that was, in his estimation, lacking within Catholicism. The, the, the yoga, the system, you know, the, how to sit, how to meditate, some technique to it, and so forth. Some, so that you could objectively go about hmm, uh, uh, controlling the mind and the senses and moving away from just emotions, beliefs, and feelings, and isolate through this methodology the self that theoretically is different from the mind and the senses, right? Hmm? Uh, while it's dependent on grace and, and so on and so forth, still there's, uh, there's a method to our madness, if you will, the madness that we pursue. Uh, um, uh, so that's objective. So we say, you know, if a science says, I'm gonna go in the laboratory and uh, you know, we're just gonna look at the facts here, hmm? And, um, you know, we're going to come to the conclusion that H2O equals water, not H3O or H4O or, or, or anything else. This is what water is. Um, so we're going to go in the, the lab of our spiritual practice. And, and like a scientist or an objective uh, person in the court of law and, and so forth, like a judge is supposed to be, for example, we're going to be um, objective. We're not going to say, I feel God should be like this. I feel the soul is like that. But we're going to have, we have a text that says God's like this, and the soul is like this. And then we have a practice by which we can realize it. Let's say we want to realize that the self is different than the mind and the body. And therefore, it's not confined within time and space. Therefore, it's eternal. Well, we want to experience that. So here's the methodology. And so there's a lot of, you have to control the mind. You have to control the sense. There's so much objectivity it goes into bringing about the subjective experience. And then if, we, then if we look at someone who has the subjective experience, there should be an objective criterion that shows up outside that serves to demonstrate that their experience, their inner experience is, is valid. Hmm? If they, in other words, if, they, if they've transcended the human passions which could be observable, well, that's observable objective evidence as to the veracity of their internal subjective uh, experience. And it's brought about by controlling the mind, the senses, and being ob ob objective, if you will, and not being sw in, that, in the sense of not renunciation as, about, for example, moving away from how it looks and feels to what it theoretically is the world, that is to say, and then, uh, and then, then living one's life accordingly by which one can start to see that, experience that oneself. So that's usually what I mean by um, the idea that the subjectivity hmm, of the, our uh, experience of our spiritual pursuit is um, 
brought about by being very objective. Hmm? And so it's an objective subjectivity, <laughs> if you will. I hope uh, that's a bit of a mouthful there, but uh, I hope you can appreciate it. But again, to use profit, simple terms, it's not just a belief, it's a science, you know, we would say. Yeah. Um, so we have anything else come up here. Uh, it sounded um, like Mahanam Brat Brahmachari. That's right. Mahanam Brat Brahmachari. His book, uh, his, which was his doctoral thesis, I think it was at University, maybe University of Chicago, I'm not sure, but um, maybe not. But it, it was, um, it is titled Vaishnava Vedanta. Fantastic book, fantastic. I, I read that book in about maybe, first read it in maybe 1990, something like that. I actually stole it. Um, I could, <laughs> I would felt guilty about it. I, I was visiting, um, I, I was in Miami for some reason and I, for the night, night, a day and a half or something like that. Um, and I stayed at uh, one of the Brinda uh, missions uh, stopover places. Um, presided over by one of my god brothers. And uh, I found this little book on the, on the shelf by Shnav Vedanta. And I, I started reading, I just, I just couldn't put it down. And, I, and I, I didn't have time to finish it, even though I read it like all night long. So I took it with me, I stole the book. And I thought, oh God, I stole from a Brahmin, you know? I made up for it later on, <laughs> but, but I still have that same book. And the pages are all falling apart uh, in it. I tie it together with a, with a Brahmin thread keep it now um i think it may be available on online um but uh, yes very uh a different godia sect to be sure but um very very um i want to say compelling a type of a presentation an insightful presentation of the philosophy oh, so anyway this is going on here but let's see uh, yes, Brahmacharya Tanya PhD. Well, yeah, someone is mentioning here, um, uh, University of Chicago. <laughs> Very good. Yes, uh, it's interesting. University of Chicago became a little bit of a of a um, <clears throat> of a uh, somewhat of a uh, breeding ground for academic uh, Gaudi Vaishnavism, which is um, often attributed to. Um, Professor Dimmock hmm, wrote a book called The Hidden Moon, but that was like in the late 60s or, or 70s when um, he became, you know, somehow con in contact with and interested in, in Gaudiya Vaishnava and started to write about it academically. But Nam Brata, um, I think his work would have preceded uh, Dimmock's, he should be given more credit. Afterwards, there were a, a, uh, were a number of devotees that. Um, got degrees in, in uh, Indology or something related like that, um, which Gaudi Vaishnava was their focus and Dimit was their, um, whatever you call them, professor. Mm. Chicago, University of Chicago, Kishore Kishori, Kijai, they're the presiding deities there. Dr. Prabhupada's Iskan, I served under them for, for many years, many, 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 many days. They were very, uh, very generous and kind uh, to me. Kishore Kishore Kijai. So uh, what else here? Any other question? Uh, um, maybe Pranada. I thought I heard Pranada. Um, maybe she had like a follow-up question. Yes. I was just going to ask about um, Mahanam Brahmachari. So I've got the information. For five minutes. Yeah. Pranada, we cannot can, hear you. Can you, can you, you can't hear Pranada? No, I can't I hear her, I can't see yeah. her. Yeah, I can hear Pranada. Um, I think uh, in Pranada, you, I can still hear you, so you can just correct me. You were yeah, wanting so to just, hear more. No, no, oh. I got every, all the information about the book he was talking about. Okay, so you don't have a question? It gives you, that no. was answered. Okay, okay. Um, and then um, I heard, Vijay Kumar asking a question. Um, can you try talking, Vijay? Because I, I, I don't think the Guru could hear you, but I could also hear you. Can you hear me? 
Yeah, I can't hear him. You Good can't hear him. No. Okay, so he can't hear you. Are you? Did you do mute original okay. audio? Yes, I did mute original audio. So okay. let's go unmute it and uh, English and mute it. Now, can you hear me? I don't think he can hear you. Do you want to ask me your question now? and then I can ask it? Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, last week he was talking about the Citadea and the Sadika Dea, I believe. And the Sadika Dea being uh, what we are when we practice and the Citadea being what we were given when we were initiated. Uh, one being eternal and one being here in the material world. So I was just wondering when we were given our Citadea, he sees that so that eternality is there always or? I feel like that. I can hear you. I can hear you now, but you're a little confused as to what I said. Um, we yeah. have the Sadika Dea. <laughs> And the sadhaka daya, it means the practitioner's body. So we right. have a material body, and the material body is, is kind of made up of senses, right? It's not in the senses. And these senses context sense objects, and we like or dislike them, and in, in a kind of an identity that kind of arises out of that, my likes and my dislikes. But when we come to bhakti and take initiation, then our, then our material body turns into um, a, a, a practitioner's body, a spiritual practitioner's body, rather than a material body. So what that means is that the body made up of senses and the mind now strives with it, that instrument, we strive to be engaged in relation to sense objects, not merely for the pleasure of our senses, but for the pleasure of Krishna's senses. Now that, as we perfect that sadhaka deha and those material senses by using them only for the pleasure of Krishna's senses, the result of this internally is that a meditative, if you will, body, uh, which is sometimes referred to as the siddhadeha, arises in, in Bhava Bhakti. And in that siddhadeha, one then internally through meditation, um, begins to participate in the meditative land of Krishna Leela, and that meditation is perfected in from and turning churning the bhava, if you will, into prema, mm -hmm. and then one uh, you know uh, enters into into the Leela in eternally in in that siddhadeha. And in the context of doing that, of course, the sadhaka day has, has also become perfected. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it also becomes siddhi perfect. And that's why then we take the body of great sadhus who we deem have, have um, achieved such a um, perfection of their practitioner's body uh, we entomb that, we make up samadhi, we make, it's a worshipable place, maybe we keep the photo of their form and, and so on and so forth, uh, and it, it becomes worshipable by us. So those are the three bodies. You've got a material body, a sadhikadeya, and a siddhadeya. Sadhikadeya gives rise to the siddhadeya, and in the context of doing it, the sadhikadeya itself becomes um, perfected, if you will. So I hope that uh, clarifies these uh, uh, terms. Yeah, that helps a lot. And so Good. the system, my question was, you, you, when you gave me my initiation, uh, you supposedly see the majority of my citadel and then I went towards that or, and I, the citadel is eternal, but the Sadaka Dea and the practitioner's body, their material, but being perfected to this citadel. Is my understanding correct? I'm sorry, we didn't hear it. Can you say it again? Um, so my sadhaka dea and my material body are working towards the citadea, and that citadea is eternal. And right. uh, I'm working towards that. You see that when you give me initiation, uh, that eternality, or is it there always? We were born with it or we, we have to attain it 
Well, the Siddha day is eternal. Therefore, it's mentioned in Chaitanya Charitamrita in other places. The, the, the ideal that we will pursue is eternal. If it's not eternal, then why should we pursue it? Hmm. I so see. It's, it's eternal. The Siddha day is eternal, and you will attain it. And, um, yeah, that would, you, that's you, what my question was. I, so I have a chance to attain the Siddha day eternality in this Sadaka day of body. That's right. You have a chance to do that. That's what, that's exactly what we're doing. Very well said. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Clarification. That's yeah. That, that's nice. Good. All right. So that's we're out of time. And next week I'll be in Poland, uh, so I won't be here. Maybe the next week after. I'm not sure when when I return in terms of how. It, uh, relates to a Sunday, but uh, I look forward to the next Sunday that we can get together and hope you'll be able to tune in to the uh, lecture series that we do there in Poland over the next couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to make some announcements. You probably saw this in your email. Um, so it's like the July programs. Um, it's cool because it's uh, you just kind of figure it out with your own time as you normally do. Um, <laughs> I was looking and like some of the classes are at 3 a.m. our time or my time. Um, so I guess there will be a Swami call, but the time will be announced later. Is that correct, Archana? On Sunday? That's what it's saying here. Um, anyway, so just like definitely check your email. Um, uh, at 3 a.m. tomorrow, Pabanava Swami is giving a class. And then on the 6th of J July, Wednesday, Breku is giving class. And then, yeah, all uh, the week after that, Three Day will be in Poland. Um, so that's cool. Anyway, uh, the call remains a mystery at the moment. Okay, yeah, that means... That, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay, cool. Um, alrighty. Thank you, everyone.